Well, welcome to the Addiction Connection podcast, connecting the hope of the gospel with the heart of addiction. I'm Mark Shaw, and I've got Jim Quigley with me, along with special, special, special guest, Jay Younts. Am I pronouncing that right, Jay? Younts. Uh, Younts. I just call him Jay. I don't have to say the Younts too much. So, Amen. <laughs> I want to start with scripture here in Ephesians chapter four. I've got the NASB, but uh, you may want to um, talk about the 84 version. I couldn't pull that one up. Um, I'm sure it's out there. I just could, I couldn't pull it up. Ephesians four uh, night. Let's start. Let's start in 17. So I say this and affirm yep. in the Lord that you are to no longer walk just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And then here's our key verse, verse 19. And they have, and they, excuse me, and they having become callous have given themselves up to indecent behavior for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And so that's going to be where we'll focus because we're going to talk about uh, the lust cycle and um, and have you kind of unpack that. Now, how does the 84 version read, Jay? Okay, well, picking up from uh, mm-hmm. verse 18, those, you know, those who walk, walk the way the Gentiles do, in other words, practice that way of thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, very similar to Romans 1, and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And here's the 84 version. Having lost all sensitivity. Sensitivity means that I care about you, right? Okay. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality. Sensuality means I care about me. Me. (laughs) Right. Okay. So that's the, and so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. And the, the Greek word there in, in the, is, is that, I'm not an expert in the Greek, but I know enough to know that what's going on there is the, what's meant is something that it can't be satisfied. Mm. Yes. It just keeps, you know, you get something and you want more. And so the uh, when the lust cycle, then <clears throat> we have to understand what it is that's driving it. Because when as soon as you acquire what you're lusting for, you're never satisfied. You know, so that's what that's what drives it. So people make the mistake; they keep on going back to what they were trying to achieve to get satisfaction. And they, they never get it. So that that's the that's the eighty four version. Good, good. Now apply this to um, a, a sexual sinner, someone who is addicted, as the world would say. We know it's the heart, and you know, and all that. We're biblical counselors, so we we understand there are biblical descriptions that are better than what the world really has. But um, mm-hmm. apply that to sexual sin, pornography, um, lust, for, adultery, uh, fornication, sure. any of that. Sure. Okay. Well, let's let's take um, let's take um, um, pornography and masturbation together. Okay. That's something that uh, you know. You guys who know you've counseled um, some women, mostly men. Uh, women are getting more into it, unfortunately. But uh, what's happening there, Mark, is that they feel guilty. They, they, they do the, the deed. They look at the porn. They do the masturbation. And they feel guilty. And they're overcome with it. And I've, you know, unless your heart is super hard in the way that Romans 1 talks about, uh, you know, a young man who has done this stuff, or an older man, uh, they, they feel awful. You know, they're disgusted. That they want to throw up, and then they'll go plead with God to uh, not do this again. And the and you know I've heard the prayers, and you know, and they're they're just deep, heartfelt prayers, but they're addressing the wrong thing. 
see, the pornography and the masturbation are the symptom of what's really the problem, the root of this thing. So the lust cycle, by trying to stop the pornography, all you do is encourage the cycle. Mm. You've got to see what's happening. So in this, in this chart that I have on the lust cycle, I'm, start, I'm, I'm discontent with something. I'm upset with something. I'm unhappy. I, I feel guilt, whatever. So then the next thing I do is I look for relief. So I'm looking for relief. I'm trying to find relief from this thing. And what drives pornography, what drives masturbation, is the anticipation of it, not the actual act itself. Because there's no satisfaction in it. As a matter of fact, there's just disgust and whatnot. So you start down here with this problem down here that's not directly connected to those things. Mm-hmm. I'm looking for relief. I don't go to God for relief. I don't go to Christ for relief. I go to something that I can get in my mind so that ah, I can get distracted by this you know, pornography or masturbation, I then do the deed down here and I'm distraught by it. I pray, but I don't pray for the root cause. I pray that I won't do the porn again. But all I've done is left the symptom to, to, to fester. So it's uh, the prayer in that sense is kind of like taking a pain reliever, an aspirin or an Advil for, for an infection. You might stop the pain for a minute, but if you don't kill the infection, it's just going to keep on growing. Mm. So they get more upset. They get, they fall back into it. They haven't addressed the root problem. They're looking for relief again, and the whole cycle starts all over again. Mm. And then after a while, they've been praying fervently and asking for people to help them and going to small groups and reading books and all the rest of that doesn't go in. Then their faith begins to really weaken. Mm. They doubt God, and then they just that sets them up for more crap, more stuff. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, that's in in the in the sense of Philippians three eight. Anyway, uh, that sets them up for more problems. So, uh, until we get to that root thing that is causing it, what is it that's spurring the lust cycle? So, th- their prayers need to be directed to where is driving it so they're they're feeling inadequate they're feeling guilty um well oh look at that cycle right oh cool uh technology strikes yeah so (laughs) so they're they're upset with this thing Mm -hmm. and until they begin to address that root cause they'll just keep on coming back and hounding them And then, as you know, what happens when we start engaging, um, you know, Proverbs 5 is also the key passage here where it talks about, you know, don't, don't be um, excited or infatuated or uh, desirous of another man's wife. Be desirous of her and her body. And so that sets up a cycle in our minds. And what? And so instead of being captivated by your wife and having all of your sexual thoughts and things geared towards her, now with the pornography and the lust, we're actually cutting new pathways in our brain. Mm. And so you're setting up an actual physical desire for these things. So the, that's, that's at the root. So a classic example of that that I like to use is the story of Amnon and Tamar. And... Uh, you know, Mark, stop me anytime I get incoherent. So just, you know, no, it's warm, good. <laughs> okay. So, so you, you've got Amnon and Tamar in, in 2 Samuel 13. And you can say a whole ton about the passage about David's parenting and all the rest of that. And, uh, you know, influence of wrong friends. But at root, um, Amnon thinks that he has to have Tamar. She's, she's Absalom's sister, so she's beautiful. And he thinks that he has to have her. So he goes through this whole scheme to get her to the point where, you know, he's in a position to want to demand sex from her. And she responds to him and says, look, don't do this. This is wrong. Speak to David. 
and he will give you, he will give me to you a marriage. In effect, saying, you can have me all you want. She's, you know, desperately trying to get this thing worked out in a way that's equitable and right before God. And he won't have anything to do with it. He goes ahead and rapes her. And then when he gets what he wants, what does he do? He throws her out. And so now the passage says that he hated her with more than the quote unquote love he had for her before. Right. See, that's a classic example of how this lust cycle has its focusing on the wrong thing. Mm. Because, you know, Amnon got what he wanted, but is he satisfied? Now he's more angry and bitter than he ever was before. Mm. And of course, we see the horrible impact of all of that, which actually started with David, you know, breaking the lust cycle when starting the lust cycle because he thought he could be satisfied with Bathsheba, mm. which of course he wasn't. And you know, we we. Uh, I mean, that's, that, that example is just as graphic as the one of Amnon because, you know, when he has um, when he has Uriah killed, Uriah served with Bathsheba's husband and Bathsheba's father. They were both the David's elite 30. These were two guys that would take a, a spear for David. But he didn't care. He just wanted that particular moment. And, of course, was it satisfying? No. So that's where I'm tying this to Ephesians 4 with the continual lust for more. And that's why I like that particular way that the wording represents the Greek in the NIV 84 was the continual lust for more. Mm. Well, and, so you and you, go ahead. And I was just going to tell the, the listeners or viewers to read 2 Samuel 13. That's where. Uh, you'll yes. get all the details in this, but Jay did an excellent job of summarizing this uh, tragedy of, of just uh, following this lust cycle mm. for Amnon and then how he treated her. She said, you know, this this wrong you're doing to me, casting me out of your presence is worse than the first wrong, the yep. rape, like, the, you know, and, and oh, it's such a heart wrenching biblical um, account. Yeah. I don't want to call it a story. Yeah. Well, narrative is good. The biblical narrative, the biblical narrative. stories are good if we use them yeah. if we use them correctly. But again, you see, again, she still comes to him and says, "Go talk to David. Don't do this." Yeah, yeah. You can still have me as much as you want. Right. Wow. And you see, he wasn't he wasn't focused mm -hmm. on Tamar at all. Mm -mm. Mm. And and that's what you get in this cycle of lust. This is what. Uh, drives a real addiction in the right sense of the word. Right, right. You know, you know, it's just never, ever satisfied. Yeah, I was actually but, just thinking um, that your chart here, I mean, we're specifically talking about lust, but it would be legitimate to use with a lot of different uh, sins, besetting sins that people struggle with. Would, would, that, would that be accurate, Jay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the substance abuse, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, um, Self injury, yeah, you know all, all those kinds of things. If you're not addressing the heart issues, what's driving? Uh, then you're just going to be stuck in this cycle. And you know, you know what? Uh, you you are. I, I'm sure this is no secret to you, but um, you are literally uh, giving me. Uh, a, 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 I'm remembering. I'm remembering accountability groups that I've been involved in throughout the years that have just done nothing but promote this cycle. <laughs> um, yep. I mean, well-meaning, well-meaning Christian people, Absolutely. right? Um, but this is the cycle that they, they, they actually use in their accountability groups, right? I mean, yeah. we're all praying together intensively about the yeah, act. And, uh, um, and then we just, uh, our relief, uh, 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 usually, if we can't make it to the accountability group, um, obviously it it it, uh, it leads back to the the sin again, and you're just back at the accountability group, repeating the same thing over and over. And over. I actually got so disgusted with accountability groups like that, I just stopped going to them. So, well, and and you see, the problem there is is the intent is not bad. Mm. 
Right, right. That's that's the thing. But but the problem with intentions is that uh, intentions and five bucks will get you a pro- couple overpriced coffee. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you you can't trust intentions. Yeah, you know, it, it, this whole discussion is actually exciting me because uh, it's a reminder that the that that God does uh, have us figured out. You know, He knows how our hearts work, and He's given us what we need um, in order to address hearts. But in contrast, you know, um, uh, to the world that will basically try to to uh, to help you by saying that you shouldn't feel guilty about this stuff. You know. You should just actually follow your heart, right? Um, and it's just some kind of uh, way you were grow- you you were raised or whatever. And we 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 see how 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 that's manifesting right now in our times. It's like, hey, those feelings you have in your heart, they're not wrong, they're not bad. So uh, you should just stop feeling guilty about them. Well, and and to see Jim, what what we have going on here is. Um, um, we keep lowering the bar oh. in terms of what's acceptable. And so, um, you know, the fifties and sixties, um, mm. a lot of pornography would be described as partial nudity. And of course mm. we didn't stop there. <clears throat> right. And so this, we keep on lowering the bar. So in terms of, you know, masturbation, instead of it being a problem, we focus on the wrong things. You know, we focus on the particular act instead of the issue of what's really being addressed in the heart. And so then you make people a prey to that because they, they really want to be done with it. Yeah. But they want to be done with pornography. But the problem with pornography is, is that, you know, just unpacking pornography, what are you doing? You're making, you're making an object out of women. Mm-hmm. For your own particular pleasure, right? You are participating in the murder of women. You are promoting trafficking. You are promoting, um, you know, a view of women that their job is to service you, and that gets ingrained into that. And that's why you know our young men right now are thinking that marriage is going to solve the problem of pornography, right? Mm-hmm. All marriage will do is increase the problem of pornography. Right. Because biblical sexuality, uh, Mark, you said I was supposed to do this, so I'll, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> biblical sexuality, which I address here in the little book on you know, sex and marriage, uh, biblical sexuality is about giving. It's not yeah. about getting. Right. So... The reason why we've got to contain sex to marriage and and then the boundaries of marriage is that what ultimately needs to be driving our sexual um, actions is the desire to give the gift of Christ to my wife. Mm. But nobody's talking about that. Well, I think Most uh... most marriages aren't there. And, and you know, there's a really scary, um, there's a really scary uh, part of that verse we're reading in Ephesians, and we talked a little bit about it. And it's just that desens- desensitized or callousness that happens yeah. from being just completely stuck in this. Like you, um, would you call, would you would you call that like for a believer um, uh, a quenching of the spirit? Well, it's certainly that. I mean, it's, it's basically just denying the spirit and, mm-hmm. and promoting yourself. You know, you know the um, a little <laughs> bit later on, you've got in verse um, thirty in chapter four. Mm-hmm. It, you know, Paul talks about don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Right. And I, I you know, we need to be able the amazing condescension of God and. God making himself vulnerable to our garbage. Yeah. <laughs> it's just mind blowing. So we're we're doing all that as well. So we're trashing women, we're making objects of women. We're making objects of our own desires. Hmm. And they can never be satisfied. <clears throat> yeah, you've uh, so they, um the um 
you've never, I've never shared my personal testimony with you or anything, but, uh, uh, I had, um, I have two long-term, I have two la large stints of sobriety in my own, uh, uh, struggle with substances. Um, and, uh, during a five year relapse that I was in, in between these two, um, uh, long sense of, uh, sobriety, um, I, I reached a point to where, um, I, I really had lost a lot of conviction. You know, there was just, I had gotten so callous about my sin. It was, it was almost, but there was, there was this, this where I was led into to some true repentance um, at the end of that five years that that when I truly repented, um, I'm not speaking of like in a, in a charismatic sense, but you want to talk about the ringing, the ringing conviction coming back almost overnight um, after a, a time of true repentance. That was something I really experienced. And and I still think about it to this day. I mean, that was over 12 years, almost 12 years ago. And, uh, I was almost afraid to, I had a, I had a real fear not to, not to listen to the conviction every day that I was, it was almost like a blessing. It was, it's kind of hard. Well, like it's not hard to explain. I think you guys understand what I'm saying, but I often tell people that, you know, I was, I was so steeped in sin and a lack of repentance that I'd kind of, I had quenched the spirit in my life for some time. And, uh, it, it, that's a scary state to be in. That's why I was saying that those verses are haunting because you really feel hopeless when you're, when you're in that kind of a state. Well, what that feeds, Jim, what you're talking about too, what that feeds is the difference between regret and repentance. Mm. So, you know, you've got in second Corinthians seven uh, verses eight, nine, 10, 11, you've got in there, this description of regret leads to worldly sorrow, which leads to death. Yes. So what's happening in this lust cycle and other things that don't get at the root of it is that we've got a lot of regret going on, mm -hmm. but we don't have repentance. So, you know, if, if you could, if I could draw a little line like this, regret means I right here, I realize I'm doing the wrong thing. And I feel terrible about it. And I tell everybody about it. Repentance means I'm going the other way. It's, right. it's a 180, you know, the Greek term metanoia. So I'm going this way. But then what verse 10 says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, it, for first case, 2 Corinthians 7, is that repentance leads to life. Yeah. And, and real freedom. Yeah. And, and so that's both in the life to come, but it's also real life right now, which I think is what you're trying to describe. Mm -hmm. And so this, 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 the, these kinds of cycles of lust and, and dealing with them, they, they produce a lot of regret. But then, as you mentioned, we become hardened to those yeah. things. Mm. And so, I, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it's, um, 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 I, I, I think of a, of a cover that um, uh, Johnny Cash did about the song Hurt, where he does something to hurt himself just to see if he can still feel you know and that that whole uh, that whole sense of just lostness that we have mm -hmm. when we're not really dealing with what the core issue is so you may be dissatisfied but you may feel guilty about something you may have um you know some sin that is um uh, that you've not repented of there may be a sense of um um, a false sense of pride where we're beating ourselves up, where we haven't actually trusted fully in the rich salvation that we have in Christ. Man, I, I, I love Jay Yout's even more today that he knows the song Hurt by Johnny Cash <laughs> because Mark, <laughs> Mark, uh, Mark knows my, my past in the grunge movement and that Johnny Cash covered a song by Trent Reznor from uh, Nine Inch Nails called no, Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Now, if you had told me before this started that we were going to talk about Nine Inch Nails yeah. uh, with Jay Yance, I would have uh, I would have uh, bet the farm against that for sure. If you've never <laughs> heard that song by Johnny, the Johnny Cash cover, it is a powerful song. Uh, 
uh, Mark. You should you should hear it sometime. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sadly, you know, Johnny still wants. Johnny still thinks he could have done it better. Yeah. And and that's how he ends the song. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I can't judge his heart, but but uh, but but you know this. Uh, so much of us. He the song has the courage to say like like it is because he looks at his accomplishments and he and he calls it this empire of dirt. Yep. And that's when we begin to look at what we've done for ourselves, what we try and accomplish, we realize that all we're doing is dealing with more dirt. Mm-hmm. Mm. Or more more powerful language, what Paul refers to in Philippians. Mm. You know, Philippians three. And we we run from that. Instead mm-hmm. of running to Christ, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, Mark, the key passage here in 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 the, in the Philippians and the Ephesians passage is verse twenty, mm. you know, which says, "You did not come to know Christ that way." And and I read for years; I just editorially inserted in there, "You did not come to know about Christ that way." Mm. But it doesn't say that. It says you come to know Christ. And the uh, Peter O'Brien, which is a he's a decent Old Test- New Testament scholar, he points out that this is the first time in the Bible, and from what he can tell in Greek literature, where the phrase "learning a person" is used. Hmm. And so, this idea of learning Christ, of mm-hmm. knowing Christ, well, that's, that's good. that that's the opposite of four seventeen, right? Right, right. I insist on it. You must not walk as the Gentiles do. Mm. But Paul says, you, however, in contrast to what? Verse 17, did not come to know Christ that way. Mm. And, then, and then you have the whole put on, put off dynamic. Right. But if we don't start here, then the put off, put on dynamic only feeds accountability cycles, only feeds the lust cycle. Yeah. You've got to have Christ at the center of it. I, I loved how you you described Second Corinthians seven. I've I've taught on that passage to our our men and women here at Freedom Farm so many times because I've what I was describing to you that feeling of quenching the spirit for I, I in Second Corinthians seven there it says just like you said worldly sorrow leads to death whereas uh, godly sorrow uh, leads to uh, repentance, which leads to salvation without regret. And I and I make the distinction. I, I stop and really talk about how, yeah, I'm sure that there is a sense of we're talking about eternity, but I think this is talking about a spiritual state more than anything for believers. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the 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 term salvation is not a good one. There, life right. is better. Wait, what is which one is better? Life. Life. life is better yeah because, because it does because we, we 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 have this crazy idea that salvation only means going upstairs right right and like that's mm-hmm. where that power of that passage is for me because i tell people if you're stuck in this worldly sorrow and regret it really if you're a believer it feels like death and you know part of my Part of my testimony, uh, also, you know, I I had a real attempt at taking my own life, where you know, I mean, I really did. I felt like absolute. I did not want to continue living, and um, and and I, looking back on it is because I was in such regret, you know, worldly yeah. sorrow. I I just there was no godly sorrow then. Yeah. Well, see, verse eleven says godly sorrow brings. Um, Repentance that leads to leads to salvation, leads to life. Uh, I'm sorry, I read the wrong. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. Mm-hmm. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear mm-hmm. yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what affection, what concern, and what readiness to see justice done. At this point, every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in the matter of what you accused, what the problem was. Mm-hmm. But notice it's repentance that does that. Right. You know, it's, it's not an eagerness to be done with it. It's an eagerness to go forward. Right. And so, you know, people already know, you know, our, our problem there, guys, is that we are 
trying to give people information. They already know they're doing something stupid. Yeah. We don't need you know, to play the Holy Spirit in the conviction game. You know, <laughs> what we need to do is to lay out what the Bible says and challenge them on the basis of, of you know, Mark and I have talked about this before, you know, stuff like this where people are struggling, they get to ask my favorite question. How's that working out for you? <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's, we have people that are doing these things and they've been going for years and years and years, but what they wind up with is just, the repeating cycle there is is like the situation in the Gospels where the guy gets rid of one demon, he gets his house cleaned up, and all that happens is, is the other demon say, wait, this is a great place to live. Mm -hmm. And then they come running back. You know, and the only way to get there is not a clean house. It's Christ in a messy house. Hmm. Amen. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, this is why jay has been called gandalf gandalf <laughs> by kirk cameron mm -hmm. of all people <laughs> well and jay has uh some great books he mentioned the uh the one on sex and uh, every biblical counselor should have that book and everyday talk is another book that he has written his wife who is now where we all want to be she's with jesus ruth has written some great little books. Mary found this one, uh, her Bible note cards. This is for kids. And so Ruth, before she went on to glory, uh, did a lot of writing and work too. And then Jay has a, a YouTube channel that you need to subscribe to called Everyday Talk 24-7. He does a morning and a night Devo. Uh, 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 right now, I'm just doing the mornings. Or just the mornings now. right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he 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 has been. I mean, churning it out. I thought I churned it out until I met Jay, <laughs> and so <laughs> Jay's got me beat by times ten thousand. I think. I mean, you you really produce some good stuff, and it's and it's provocative. It's not your standard. What, what I really appreciate about Jay is, and I know he doesn't want me talking about him, but he doesn't just give you the the nicely packaged thing that you always hear and you could get anywhere. He makes you think in a different way about things that we've always kind of read and talked about in Christi Christian, Christian ease, trying to say it like a language, you know, Christianity language, but Jay makes you think about it. And I just so appreciate that about you, you know, yeah. just like you just well, did here with Jim, Jim's mind blown. I saw it. <laughs> and, and since you mentioned Ruth, don't forget this one. Yes, get wisdom. Get wisdom. You know, yeah, it's it's twenty three lessons about wisdom. Uh, it's written for kids, but I can't think of an adult that couldn't use it. Mm. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Anyway, I, yeah. Just to, to the end. Well, I wanted to make sure I I plugged you and um and I you know oh, I've had those the privilege of, of meeting Jay decade or so ago. I mean, it might've been 15 years and uh, just being familiar with his, the way he thinks. I, I really appreciate that. And both you guys are thinkers. So I thought this will be an interesting and you don't know each other, which I really like because I like that tension and dynamic where you're getting to know each other and, you know, and Jim's kind of a newbie, Jay, like I, you're, you're kind you know, of I'm totally newbie. So, <laughs> So, so he needs a little instruction from Gandalf. Today. A lot, a lot. I, I need <laughs> wisdom. I need wisdom. So. And man, I do too. So we're, we're two hungry lads. Hey, tell us a little bit about uh, your relationship with Jay Adams. Jay Adams is someone I uh, love. I had a few conversations with him, maybe a handful, four or five over the years i did sit on his lap and it and a picture was taken i told him i said i don't think i need to sit on your lap you know i was afraid i'd break his legs so uh i i did that that photo op with jay but um i've always appreciated jay adams and um boy he is a misunderstood uh character um you know i, I people just don't don't get jay adams and they're highly critical of him and and you knew Jay, so just tell us a little bit about that. Um, 
I started reading him in the 70s. And then um, when we decided to move to South Carolina uh, in 1989, we found out that Jay was actually going to be planning a church in South Carolina. So um, we got in touch with uh, Jay and through a son-in-law and just wanted to start, had a conversation. We decided, well, church is pretty important. So that's what we decided to live there. So we were, we were members of his church. Um, it was blessed to be able to be, work with him, uh, served as an elder there and uh, got to sit on a many, um, many counseling sessions and just, just, just a lot of, a lot of opportunity for just really close conversation. And you're right. He's been character, you know, characterized as a, as a caricature of uh, yeah somebody somebody just throws bible verses at you and, if not if not just the actual bible <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, yeah, the, in, in the in the counseling situations he was more compassionate than i am than i was mm. you know and just um, um this idea of really listening to people um I remember one time somebody we were talking and um, Jay took copious notes during the counseling. I can't do that. I can write down some lines and some mm. thoughts and remember all that kind of stuff. And so this, this one individual was saying something, like, you know, well, you know, I'm trying to remember what I was saying earlier about, you know, X, right? He said, just a minute. And he flips back three pages of notes and reads verbatim what she had said. Wow. And this is a half hour previous. Wow. <laughs> you know, and um, so wow. uh, he's been criticized about being too much on habits, but I think people are starting to realize that, you know, habits are not mechanical. You know, habits are a response of thoughts that we have. And so I was fortunate to spend a lot of time. We, we had really good discussions about emotions and that was pretty formative with me because emotions come from what we think they're automatic and instantaneous so that's why we think they have a life of their own yeah but my emotions are framed by the things that i think the things that i value so if i want to change my emotions i've got to change the way that i think mm. so the wisdom literature in particular one of the reasons that ruth and i would you know, I mean, I'm just so fortunate because she has such a huge background in Hebrew. But we talked about, you know, the the wisdom literature is really God's guidebook to your emotions. And so Job feared emotion, the Lord, and shunned evil. So emotions are designed to work for us and not against us. Mm. And so the but just just the chance to work with Jay, the thing, thing I appreciate about it most is just a very relentless um commitment to scripture hmm. uh, you know i think if if there's a flaw is that he wrote more than you can imagine you know i mean the guy just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and and but he, what he asked for is for people to look at his work examine it and build on it he never considered himself to be the bottom line or the last word hmm. He didn't think scripture was the last word, but he, you know, if you, you read several of his books, he says about this, look, I'm, all I'm doing is breaking the surface here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want people to come along and do all the hard work that still needs to be done. And so mm -hmm. what you mentioned earlier, you know, in the, uh, when I grew up, there was a guy named um, Clyde Naramore who was in the, um, he, he, he was a, you know, regular counselor, but he would be someone who would be considered a counselor and a Christian, or even a Christian counselor, if you will, uh -huh. but not really some, you know, someone who really bought into a whole biblical worldview. And Jay kind of broke that mold. Mm. But anytime you break the mold, uh, there's going to be some lots of loose ends. And so Jay gets criticized for the loose ends. Um, without us appreciating the fact that he gave us this Bible that we could trust. 
It's, it's so amazing to, speaking to the caricature of Jay Adams, the, the statement you just made where he literally says, look, I don't want to be the end all say all here. I'm just breaking the surface where what has he turned out to today? He is the end all say all when people are arguing against him. You know, they're like, yeah, well, yeah. Jay Adams said this and Jay Adams. So, so that makes this wrong, you know. There's usually that comparison, and uh, man, so they're, yeah. I mean, uh, someone that's you know, new. If you want to look, if you want to look hard enough, you can find things in all of us that you know we wish we would have said differently. Yeah, mm. you know, and um, you know, Jay's like all the rest of us; he's not perfect, mm-hmm. but but he did have this grand vision. Yeah. And for, for that. And, and I think the other thing I really appreciate about Jay is he had a commitment that the Bible really is all that we need. Mm. But you see, even that gets misunderstood. Yeah. You know, or you don't believe in doctors then, or, you know, you know, this or, you know, whatever. Um, the Bible is meant to be applied to life. Right. And we've taken the Bible and we have turned it into something, which is a little encyclopedia, which we use for our own value. And what the Bible is meant is meant to impact our life so that we are transformed by it. Yes. And we don't do that by Bible verses. Mm-hmm. You know, so the idea, you know, that uh, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the father that, um, you know, Moses again says, you know, these words are not idle words for you. These words are your life. Mm. And so there's, there's so much work to be done. There's a ton of work to be done. And so the, the, my appreciation for Jay is just that he began that work. And mm-hmm. rather than criticize whatever falls we could find in him, and there are some, but uh, rather than criticize those, let's, let's you know, believe that God has given us everything we need in his word. Mm-hmm. And it's our, it's our flaw to make the word of God into something where we put it into a sense, sense of laws and precepts, you know, and the, the, you know, Jim, the passage that haunts me is the uh, passage in Isaiah 29, where, uh, you know, the criticism is and Jesus repeats it in Mark seven, but where, you know, the Lord tells Isaiah to tell the people, these people come at me with things that they have learned, memorized by rote, but their hearts are far from me. Uh. Mm. You know, and and that's what Jesus nails the you know hypocrites for, and the leaders in Mark seven. Mm. You know, it's got to impact our heart. Yeah. You know, and, and that's you know, parenting is probably the thing that I'm most passionate about, and that's that that whole emphasis in Deuteronomy six. But you, you know, Mark, you probably need me not to stop. You need me to stop <laughs> talking because I'll, I'll be at that another twelve hours. So. But well, that, we, we, we don't want information transfer. We want heart to heart transfer. That's right. That's right. And you referred to Isaiah 29, 13, because as people draw near the, with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me mm. and their fear yep. of me is a commandment taught by men. Mm. Yep. Wow. You know, um, yeah, it's yep. not real relationship. It's not. Uh, yep. Yeah. You know, that's well, the, when you look at what you look at what Jesus does in Mark seven, uh, when he uses that to go after the Pharisees who have been, you know, ah. upset upset with his you know the disciples because they're not washing their hands properly. Right. Right. Mm. Well, I think it's important for people to hear about Jay from someone who knew Jay and spent lots of time with Jay. Because I just get tired of hearing all the criticism and and that kind of stuff, and and you know we can all be critical of any one of us, but uh, here's a guy who laid down his life, and because of Jay Adams, um, there have been a lot of blessings in my life. That's humanly speaking. Of course, God yeah. used Jay; it was all God, but God used Jay, humanly speaking, to be a huge blessing in my life, and. Um, and so uh, I just thought I'd throw that in there for a little extra. So, this well, is... well, thank you. Good. Like I say, th- there are some problems, but that's if you look at the mm-hmm. body of work and you look at what's happening, and and you understand that, 
there's there's so much to do and i think you know if people would take the time to read um, <clears throat> um say more the redemption which is which is about the systematic thing of it probably yeah. one book is most most misunderstood is the second one on on uh christian counselor's manual manual yeah where it 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 jumps it has a lot of practical things going on in it but it doesn't have that rich background yet mm -hmm. so so if i had a criticism i would probably say you know, i'd like to see that one written later than than you know second because mm -hmm. it, it just just because it gives people that gives us like oh i just read this i do that and do that which is the exact opposite of what he did right he's right. Just trying to get people he's just trying to get people a framework to work from right yeah is that yeah, where the, is that where take two verses and call me in the morning came from <laughs> that's exactly where it comes from <laughs> yeah from that that so. particular book and you know that that's the first book I read by Jay, and it just I was like, "This I need more of this. This is great." Yeah, amen. So God used it. Hey, and the and the whole twelve session thing and all that um, is that? Did Jay even write that anywhere or say that? I mean, people attribute that to him. And again, the caricature, you know, is oh, he says twelve sessions and that's it, and. You know what? What is what's all that about? Can you speak okay, to that? Get, let, yeah, let's get some context here. We're talking about a particular problem, and so he's addressing an, an issue. But as you know, when you get, you know, you you have the presentation problem, and then you have the underlying issues and the complicating issues that go beyond that. <laughs> that can be much more than twelve. But the other yeah. focus is, you know, he thought. You know, eight to twelve was a was a optimal time. Mm -hmm. sure. You know, for so so you could you know I could see somebody getting that you know the saying what he said, but eight to twelve was an optimal time. Um, but during that time, you may uncover some other mess, <laughs> right? Know, which which we often do. <laughs> so you know, somebody has an anxiety issue, and then we find out the reason they have anxiety is because they've you know been messing around for all. Oh, all this time and trying to cover it up or you know, et cetera, right. et cetera. Right. But um, you know, he you know, he he loved to quote, you know, the six weeks thing of uh, you know, it takes about three weeks to address the problem and three weeks to get it in, 40 days, 40 nights. You know, and so so he was big on that. But yeah. but that's on a that's <laughs> zeroing in on a particular issue. Right. Working with it, uh, you know. I, I think that there's. I use the phrase sometimes that people are uh, um, uh, unhappy, but they're not desperate. Yeah. And until you get to the point of really wanting to work on your sin, then we we can get kind of we can get off track. And so that's why in the counseling we need to have the skill to quickly discern what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, go through the whole process. So that's why you've got to do a lot of good questioning, uh, ask questions, listen carefully to what they say, and then have the courage to realize that most likely there's something under underneath that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but and to see again, they they misunderstand Jay and other. Jay didn't say that we were done at twelve weeks. What his point was, we we deal with the particular issue. And then you plug that person in to the church community. Mm. So his book, Winning the War Within, you know, talks has things like calling in reinforcements. And, you know, in other words, the, the Jay didn't believe in a fourth office, you know, pastor, elder, deacon, counselor. Mm. What he <laughs> believed was, was, you know, elders who were doing the job of counseling and then the Christian community itself competent to counsel, you know, they have people working together with us. Yeah. So somebody who may, you, you, you may formally work with them eight to 12 weeks, <laughs> but you need to hand them off to somebody who's good. Well, this is going to be ongoing with that. that if, if, if they've had a particular anger issue, just say, um, it's going to take more than eight weeks to you know, sort of fix all the stuff that they're, anger has brought about you know, like in james 3 where this this 
you, you've been running around setting relational forest fires everywhere you go. You know, you're going to do a lot of work with that. Mm-hmm. But the Christian community is designed to, that's not a counseling problem per se. That's more of a discipleship, somebody working with you and just helping you change these lifelong problems. Okay. I don't know if that helps or not, but. It, yeah. Yep. It all more, helps. Yeah. I, I even fall into that category. Oh, biblical counseling. You just take people to the word and show it to them and, and that you, you'll help them out that way. That's easy. You know, that's easy, right? It's not easy. <laughs> it's, it's actually, yeah. it's actually not easy at all. You know, um, learning how to listen to people and ask questions and, oh man. Um, and, and trusting patience in the Holy spirit to affect change and man, that's not easy. But, you know, the first, when someone first hears of the concept, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, that's super easy. You just, just sit down and talk about the Bible, right? So. Well, yeah. And Jim, there's a problem that we've got a lot of biblical counselors that do exactly that. Yes. Yes. So, and that's not and Jay's so, fault, right? It's not Jay's fault. It's just, well, yeah, you know. no, no, it's not directly, but it, it, anytime you're going to do a brown, groundbreaking thing, right. You know, then it, that's not a clean operation. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. So there's, there's, uh, um, mm-hmm. that's why he said he wanted, I'm just getting started. Right. So one of the things he didn't write much on was abuse. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, you know, he's been nailed for that and some of that. And I, you know, I can see some of the issues where that appears to be a problem. Yeah. But if, if we apply the problems that we have and, and the principles that we've got from him, you know, we can work their way through it. You know, I've, I've, it's sad to me, but I, I've, I've worked with a lot of abuse situations, mm. and, but the principles I use are the principles I learned from him. Yeah. Even though he didn't write about it as much and, and where some of this stuff has been taken out of context, you know, to, to address right. that. But, but, you know, it's our job to use the word of God and, and to run with it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what Jay did, you know, in the seventies and eighties, he was one of the most hated people in Christianity. Because they were just outraged at him. Um, mm-hmm. So um, Jim Neuheiser down at uh, RTS in Charlotte is a pretty good guy to talk to. That's some of that stuff. He, he, he gets it. That's my professor. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jim, Jim's one of the good guys. Yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's wonderful. He's a sweet, sweet man. All right. Well. This we got to do this again, fellas. What do you think? Yes, yes, I would love to. I don't know if Jay Jay's as enthusiastic as you, Jim, but I am. <laughs> hey, look, I just get to sit here and talk to you. I, you know, uh, I'm happy to any time. Yeah, well, we will do this again. I want to thank you guys both for being on the Addiction Connection podcast, and I want to thank all of our watcher or viewers excuse me and listeners for tuning in Uh, we're going to end this podcast now i want to thank jay yachts again get his books get on youtube listen to him he's just doing it once a day now not twice a day but he uh uh, every day talk great book and then the youtube channels every day talk 24 7 uh get that and his other resources Kirk Cameron has endorsed him, so you know it's good. Um, just right there, right? Uh-huh. So that's it. But he is Gandalf and uh and a blessing to me. We've we've haven't done it in a while. We're gonna get back. I put it on my calendar for next Monday, Jay, um, for you and I to uh, meet. But we were meeting, trying to do it every Monday or every other Monday and just kind of spend some time together talking. And then that was so refreshing for me to have you as a resource just to to impact my thinking and help me to stay biblical and just iron sharpening bronze or copper or whatever <laughs> I am. But um but I really appreciate that. And uh we got to get back to doing that. I I need that in my life. So I put it on my calendar for next week and uh we will do this podcast again too. So thanks well, listen, Jeff. Mark I, Mark I appreciate what you're about and what you're doing. I've got just huge respect mm-hmm. for you're just out there doing it, man. And that's really cool. 
Well, thank you. You're kind. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying, um, <laughs> trying to, to, to uh, herd cats, I think, with the addiction world and just all the stuff going on, but just trying to help people to, to stay in the word. That's where the power is, you know? Yeah. So, Amen. Amen. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jay. And thanks to our viewers. Take care and God bless. God bless. Bye.